Welcome to our Charles Taylor Adjusting webinar, an introduction to DNO insurance. Sharing their expertise today, we have Jane Dando, Chartered Specialist Adjuster for Financial Lines. Jane is based in our Dubai office, providing financial lines assistance to our clients with risks in the Middle East. Laura Obrey is Associate, Associate Director, Professional and Financial Lines, joining us from London today. She is both a barrister and a solicitor and specialises in DNO and professional liability. We are also joined by Hatem Kedder, who has managed a variety of high value commercial losses within Saudi Arabia since joining CTA in 2010. So to go through today's agenda, Jane will be providing an overview of the landscape in the Middle East and an overview of wordings. And then Laura will discuss handling DNO claims and take you through some claims examples. And then we will have some time for Q&A at the end. So like I mentioned, please do submit your questions as we go through. So I will pass over to Jane to get started. Thanks, Hayley. So historically, there's been less take up for DNO insurance in the Middle East compared to other regions. Uh, this has traditionally been influenced by the litigation environment, as well as the existence of large family owned groups of businesses who have not necessarily seen the need to purchase this cover. However, as a result of increasing regulation, an increase in litigation, and new geopolitical and economic factors, the need for DNO insurance in the region is increasing. One major worldwide change that has affected the DNO market is the coronavirus pandemic. Whilst governments have attempted to mitigate the effects of additional measures put in place to prevent the spread of coronavirus, those responsible for managing businesses have faced a number of challenges, which includes protecting the health of the workforce, ensuring businesses run to the best of their ability, and dealing with the slowing of the supply and demand chain. There's also been an increase in cybercrime across the region. We have recently seen directors taken to task over IT security, as well as how they have handled major cyber breaches after the event. Whilst the impact on share prices cannot be avoided whilst the global economy faces a downturn, directors are facing increased scrutiny over the decisions that they make and their effect on key stakeholders, profit levels and share prices. Regulatory developments have also had an impact, and there's been a number of regulatory changes across the region, as some countries have sought to attract both foreign and domestic investors and to put mechanisms in place to regulate the financial services industry. One example of this is the Saudi Arabian Capital Market Authority's introduction of a new class action regime for claims by shareholders of listed companies in the country. There has also been an increase in regulatory investigations, particularly in relation to allegations of fraud, money laundering and embezzlement. As a result of these factors, the market has significantly hardened over the last year. Premiums are drastically increasing retentions are increasing and wordings are becoming narrower. I'm briefly going to give an overview of cover under DNO policies before handing over to Laura, who will look at claims handling in further detail. So who is the insured in a DNO claim? It was previously a common conception that the insured only included those with the job title of director or officer. However, wordings have evolved and some are broad enough to include other job functions with decision making responsibilities as insured persons. Whilst the definition of an insured person depends on each specific wording, insured person can now include those named as a director, partner, member or officer. A person who holds themselves out to be a director and acts as one, but who has not been formally appointed as one. A shadow director, which is a person in accordance with whose directions or instructions the directors of the company are accustomed to act. 
the lawful spouse of any director solely because of their spouse or partner relationship following a claim against that person, and the estate's heirs or legal representative of any director or officer who has died or become incapacitated, insolvent or bankrupt, but only for a claim against that person. It's important to make sure that the person was an insured person at the time that the wrongful act notified was undertaken. So what li type of liability can be involved? DNO insurance policies offer cover to protect insureds and all their companies from claims which may arise from the decisions and actions taken within the scope of directors' regular duties. Companies purchase DNO cover because directors can make mistakes, and the cover can provide financial protection against those consequences. DNO insurance is particularly important if a company becomes insolvent. Generally, directors have a duty to act with reasonable care, skill and diligence, in good faith and in a manner that promotes the success of a company for the benefit of its owners or shareholders. Depending on the individual director's role, this can include decisions on strategy, managing the workforce and making decisions in relation to suppliers and customers. Due to the wide range of duties and obligations of directors and officers, there are in turn a wide range of liabilities that could be involved. We have listed these on the PowerPoint presentation and we'll be able to explore some of these in the next slide. Laura will also touch upon wrongful acts as commonly defined in policies later in the session. So who is the claimant? The first one on the regulatory bodies. There are a range of claims that could be brought against insured persons by regulatory bodies, which will vary across jurisdictions. However, these can include claims relating, relating to breaches of regulations regarding health and safety, insolvency and bankruptcy, insider trading, regulated activities, employment practices and financial reporting. Next, we have investors and shareholders. There has been an increase in shareholder and investor claims brought against directors and officers since the 2008 financial crisis. Claims by investors and shareholders generally arise because investors and shareholders blame directors personally for losses in share value as a result of actions or decisions taken by directors. As well as claims for mismanagement, claims by shareholders and investors can include claims relating to disclosure, for example, failure to disclose material information or issuing statements that mislead shareholders, and breach of fiduciary duties owed to investors or shareholders. Whilst directors and officers generally have a duty to act in a way that promotes the success of a company for the benefit of its shareholders, when it becomes likely that insolvency is inevitable, directors and officers generally have a duty to act in the interests of their creditors and liquidators. Claims by liquidators and creditors can include claims of breach of fiduciary duties, for example, continuing to trade despite knowing there is no reasonable prospect of a company avoiding insolvency, and claims relating to jurisdiction-specific bankruptcy laws. However, we would flag that breaches of bankruptcy laws in the UAE are criminal in nature, and any criminal fines would likely not be recoverable, with cover for defence costs subject to individual policy wordings. Laura will discuss the relevant exclusions later on. The last potential claimant we've listed are employees. We anticipate a rise in employment liability claims as a result of coronavirus and the subsequent change in working practices and locations during the pandemic. These claims are likely to include claims under jurisdiction specific health and safety regulations, claims for wrong allegations relating to a failure to prevent staff from being exposed to coronavirus or a failure to provide adequate protective equipment. The policy cover. Policies generally cover the personal liability of company directors, but also the reimbursement of the insured company in case it has paid the claim of a third party on behalf of insured persons. 
Cover is usually for current, future and past directors and officers of a company and its subsidiaries. DNO insurance grants cover on a claims made basis. This means that claims are only covered if they are made whilst the policy is in effect or with an, within an agreed extended reporting period. General conditions usually contain provisions regarding misrepresentation and non-disclosure, the governing law and jurisdiction, and an other insurance clause. Remedies for misrepresentation and non-disclosure, so painting an untrue picture of the risk or failing to disclose information which may affect underwriters' assessment of the risk, would be governed by the relevant policy law and jurisdiction. And a review of information given prior to policy inception and in the proposal form is particularly important where misrepresentation or non-disclosure may be suspected. As there are so many different types of claims that can engage with DNO policy, the other insurance clause seeks to restrict cover to elements of the claim that can only be covered under the DNO policy. Common overlaps we see with, are with professional indemnity policies, cyber and employers' liability policies. Where overlapping policies both have an other insurance clause, consideration of allocation of both, across both policies is required. DNO policies are composite policies, which means that each director or officer has separate and distinct cover under the policy. Directors and officers insurance is split into three types of cover, generally referred to as side A, side B and side C. They can be brought as standalone products or they can be brought as part of a package. So side A cover first of all. This is a typical side A insuring clause. Insurers shall indemnify the insured for losses deriving from any claim that results in their civil liability for a wrongful act committed or allegedly committed in the exercise of their duties as directors of the policyholder, which is made for the first time against them during the period of validity of the policy unless the insured has been indemnified by the company for that loss. Side A cover protects assets of individual directors and officers for claims where the company is not legally or financially able to fund the indemnification. For example, legally, certain jurisdictions may prohibit indemnification, or the articles of association within a company may also prohibit indemnification. A company may also be insolvent and not have the funds to reimburse the director. Under side A, the insured is the individual named director or officer, and there is usually no retention payable. So here is a typical side B insuring clause. Insurers will pay to, or on behalf of the company, loss incurred by the company arising from any claim for any wrongful act where an insured person has been indemnified for that loss. Side B cover reimburses the company to the extent that it grants indemnification and advances legal fees on behalf of directors and officers. It protects the company's corporate assets that are at risk as a result of an indemnification agreement with an insured director or officer. The insured is the company itself and there's usually a retention applicable. Side C, this is a typical Side C uh, securities claim insuring clause. So insurers will pay to or on behalf of the company loss incurred by the company arising from any securities claim presented for the first time during the policy period in respect of any wrongful act. Securities claims are those related to shareholder value purchased by publicly listed companies. Securities claims were not historically defined in DNO policies, but with an increase in allocation disputes when a company was named as a defendant alongside a director or officer, size C cover was developed as a product to fill the gap. Side C provides cover for the company itself when it is named as a defendant in a securities claim, and a retention usually applies. 
cover under side C is also sometimes subject to a separate limit. It's optional cover and it's not always part, purchased as part of a DNA policy. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Laura to discuss claims handling. Thank you, Jane. I'll be talking to you now about the handling of DNA claims and the common issues that we come across. But as you'll see, there is no such thing as a typical DNA claim, and that's what makes our work so interesting. Please do drop your questions into the box, as Hayley said, as we go, and we'll do our best to answer them shortly. To start with, DNA claims are often highly sensitive and often newsworthy, so we often see them making news headlines. When handling these claims, therefore, we have to be mindful of the implications of the allegations on the individual and or the company, including reputational. As I am sure you will all have experienced, notifications to a directors and officers or management liability policy can be very document heavy. With, for instance, lengthy pleadings, numerous invoices, complex corporate structure charts, and a lot of correspondence records to go through. It can therefore be very difficult to see the wood from the trees. As such, we've created some slides to help you with that process. First of all, we look to see whether a notification being made falls within the policy period. As Jane explained earlier, directors and officers policies are generally claims made policies. Best way to demonstrate that is by an example. So for instance, uh, we've recent, we recently received a shareholder derivative claim that was filed in March 2021, and it was notified to insurers in April 2021. The policy period at issue was the 1st of January 2021 to 31st of December 2021. It is therefore within the policy period and was notified in a timely manner. We next consider, is there a claim? This will depend on the policy wording and the breadth and type of cover bought. Some policies require a proceeding to be filed, but often this can include any formal complaint or request for compensation. Some provide even broader cover to include inspections or investigations. However, these will normally be defined terms, particularly investigations in the policy, rather than the dictionary definition of the word. If there is a claim within the policy period, we then look to see if it involves an insured. This can include an insured person or an insured entity or company, depending on the type of cover bought. Jane explained the types of cover earlier, but just by way of quick refresher, side A policies will provide cover for insured persons, side B is company reimbursement, and side C is for securities claims. If an insured person has a claim against them, we can then look to see if the allegations or investigations relate to their capacity as an insured person. We do this by looking at the wrongful act alleged in the complaint or investigation. We've set out a typical dictionary definition in this next slide. This will be any actual or alleged error, misstatement, misleading statement, act, omission, breach of duty, actually or allegedly committed or attempted by an insured person. As you can see, the definition of wrongful act can be quite broad. But as always, it will depend on the particular wording of the policy at issue. If all of these requirements are met, policy period, a claim and wrongful act, we then need to consider if there has been a loss. Loss can be a demand for damages, a claim for compensation, or most frequently, as set out here, for defence costs. Defence costs are normally incurred when the insured person has instructed lawyers to represent them, to provide legal advice and or represent them in any proceedings. We're gonna now do a quick poll just to see if um, you have any questions or what the knowledge is. The question is, is an insurer's prior consent to defence costs required in a policy? Is it yes, consent's required or no? Let us know what you think. Hmm. 
looks like the yeses are winning. Looking forward to hearing the outcome of this. Ah, so the results are 69% of you think that consent is required and 31% say no. Well, those who voted yes are right. Uh, defence costs do normally require insurer's consent. We can see this by the next slide. Loss is normally a defined policy term and it is often consent in conjunction with the words reasonable and necessary. This means that the instruction of lawyers, their rates and costs incurred should be proportionate to the seriousness, complexity and quantum of the notified claim. Insurers tend to have more experience of the types of claims and what would be reasonable or necessary and can provide advice and assistance to the insurer. Insurer's prior written consent is normally a policy term and it's normally required before lawyers are instructed and defence costs in incurred. However, insurers are required not to unreasonably withhold or delay this consent. And now we're going to have another poll. Can insurers get their defence costs back? Is that a yes or a no? Oh, so this is much closer. 62% say yes, uh, insurers can get defence costs back and 38% say no. Well, the answer is on this one, it very much depends. Um, so yes, in theory, subject to certain requirements. Um, so the normal situation where an insurer can get defence costs back will be if the conduct exclusion is applicable. And this would normally be if there is evidence of dishonesty, willful misconduct or fraud, then the insurer can reclaim the defence costs that have been advanced. However, this does normally require an admission or finding at final adjudication and or a final decision at court, often after all appellate levels have been exhausted. This is obviously quite a prolonged process. And um, so whilst in theory defence costs are recoverable, that doesn't always transpire. Um, defence costs advance will depend on whether there is a tension and whether this has been properly eroded. As Jane said, under side A, there is generally a nil retention, but it does depend on policy wording and also the type of defence costs. Um, so we can see on the slide that there are sublimits. So, for instance, um, extradition defence costs um, may have a sublimit applicable, um, at, as can investigations, but as always, it depends on the policy wording. And so, the next stage, if we have all those requirements, we have a claim within the policy period, there's been a wrongful act and there's been a loss as defined in the policy terms, we then need to consider if there are any applicable exclusions. On the next slide, we've set out some of the, the more typical ones that we can see. Um, we've already briefly discussed the conduct exclusion, if there is any finding or admission of dishonesty or fraud. But we also have, um, and the common one will be the professional services exclusion and or the pension schemes exclusion. These are generally exclusions in a director's and officer's liability because often there will be a PI or a PTL policy which will be more applicable in the circumstances. We often also see prior and pending litigation exclusion which could apply if the notified claim was known about prior to policy inception. Fines, penalties and sanctions exclusion often feature just because of the nature of the type of director's and officer's claims. However, public policy in the jurisdiction will often dictate whether fines and penalties are recoverable, regardless of whether um, fines and penalties is allowed for or not in the policy. 
We can often see here as well some more specific um, exclusions such as bodily injury, property damage, pollution, war and terrorism. And here we have an example of a, an exclusion. So where there is intentional wrongdoing by an insured person, which will be similar to the conduct exclusion. And then we have claims already made against the insured or driving from circumstances which the insured was already aware of or should have been aware of prior to policy inception. This becomes apparent when um, notification has become apparent um, is made and coverage investigations are underway if uh, correspondence indicates that a complaint was made formally in writing before a claim was actually filed, that that would suggest um, that there was knowledge beforehand. We thought we would create this bullet point list that will help you when considering a notification. We've been through most of these issues, but we thought it would be helpful to have a handy bullet point for you for future reference. It's also worth noting that DNO policies often involve a tower, and part of the handling of DNO claims can involve liaising with insurers in the tower to ensure a consistent and clear message is conveyed to the insured. We're now going to give you some claims examples of the type of thing that you might expect to see under a directors and officers or management liability policy. Directors and officers claims can be brought by any stakeholder, such as shareholders, suppliers, competitors and regulators, amongst others. A directors and officers policy is essentially the last line of defence when directors and officers are accused of wrongdoing in the performance of their management duties and the range of claims they're exposed to and are presented under a date no policy can therefore be diverse, often reflective of the type of company and role of the director within that company. For instance, directors of mines may face health and safety complaints or a claim for corporate manslaughter, whereas a director and officer of a pharmace pharmaceutical company may face allegations of anti-competitive behaviour or shareholder class, class actions. The Australian Royal Commission has also highlighted the range of claims a direction officer of financial institutions may face. Um, and they've seen um, investigations from a government inquiry, the ASIC uh, regulatory body, which is the Australia Securities Investigation Committee, has been active as a result of the Royal Commission's findings, and defence costs and class action complaints. We've also seen claims for defence costs where directors face costs in relation to extradition proceedings, an Interpol red notice, a government inquiry before a select committee and a shareholder complaint. So often directors can face a multitude of, um, of defence costs and need to defend themselves, all stemming from very similar allegations. Um, and we've set out here some examples for you. So we have insolvency proceedings, um, we have false accounting, uh, regulatory bodies um, in mismanagement of public assets and funds. Going on to the next slide, we have uh, serious fraud office investigations, US shareholder class actions, securities actions. Um, so as you can see, there is a wealth of DNA claims, and you never quite know what you're going to receive under your DNA policy, but that's what makes it so interesting. Now, I'm going to have a short break for any questions you may have. I can see that a few questions have come in. So, um, the first one, when should a claim be notified? Um, I'll take that one. Um, so a claim should be notified as soon as practicable, really. So as soon as there is notice that a complaint has been received or an investigation will be pursued. And notification should be made before instructing lawyers um, 
think if you need to instruct lawyers, it's generally an indication that insurers need to be involved. Okay, thanks. If there are six people who have instructed the same law firm and half are insured persons and the other half are not, how would you approach this? That's a very interesting one. So um, if you have cover for some and not others, the best way, and they all have the same lawyer, best way would be have a, a discussion with those lawyers to identify the allegations raised against in each individual and for them to define the work they're doing for each and provide budgets for each of the notifications so we can identify the total costs incurred and, and arrange just to reimburse those that are, are covered. Um, it can raise issues where there is a dispute between directors um, or the individuals raised and also some of the individuals that are covered may face more serious allegations or less serious than some of the others so that will all depend as well. But the most important thing is a good relationship with all the individuals notified and their lawyers to determine the costs incurred. Great, thank you. What happens if there are a number of directors seeking cover under a policy with a relatively small limit? It's another interesting question. As I mentioned earlier, um, DNO policies are composite policies, so each director separately has cover. Um, it depends on the wording, really, but generally it's a case of first come, first served. So legal fees are usually paid in the order in which they're received. Um, once the limit has gone, there's no cover left. Okay. Um, what is the role of the loss adjuster in the DNO claim? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, well, a loss adjuster uh, can help with their review of the notification material, which, as I mentioned, ca can be quite uh, voluminous. Um, our assistants can help, or any loss adjuster's assistants can help by identify what further information is needed to be able to complete those coverage investigations and move things on in a in a quick way, so the insured. Um, can reach a grounding on, on the coverage position available. Uh, loss adjusters can also monitor developments in proceedings, advise on next steps. Um, they can also identify any discrete areas that will benefit from a legal opinion. Uh, I, I guess um, as well can assist with any translation issues because if the loss adjusters have a wide range of offices uh, with multiple language skills that can assist in, in coordinating as well and in a, a quite helpful role of a loss adjuster there can be if coverage is confirmed they can monitor and reconcile defence costs um, I had an interesting one uh, about a year ago where we had about 21 individual DNOs all counted as insured persons all had uh, separate lawyers which were incurring costs and providing invoices for reimbursement and, and that was obviously quite an onerous job for the insurer to have to go through and monitor so again that's something that a loss adjuster could assist with. Okay the next one um, what about VAT is this recoverable? Well, uh, that very much depends. So, uh, speaking from a England and Wales perspective, it depends if a company is reimbursing. So, if a company is reimbursing, say, the insured person, they would normally be able to reclaim VAT. So, in which case, an insurer would reimburse, say, defence costs excluding VAT. But if it was a normally in their side A situation where they weren't receiving assistance from the company in VAT for that reason or for insolvency or a number of other reasons can't reclaim VAT, then VAT would be recoverable. Okay. Again, it depends. 
Um, when can a claim be brought under a policy? Um, well, a claim needs to be um, brought within or relate to um, the policy period, but you can have runoff cover or extended discovery as well. So if the claim is made within that time period, then um, then that will apply. But as Shane says, normally you would expect to receive that as soon as practical or as soon as you, you have awareness of that. So insurer's awareness is normally a defined policy term as well. So under the notification, often condition precedent wording as well. So. Okay. Um, does an employee count as an insured person? So, as you saw, it depends on the policy wording. Um, <laughs> as discussed earlier, some policies are broad enough to include those undertaking the roles of the director who have not been appointed as such. But um, it would depend on the definition of an insured person in the policy and the roles being undertaken by that specific person that the allegations have been made against. Okay. Um, as misleading is covered, in case it has been proven that the misleading act or statement was made intentionally by the insured to induce his client into purchasing a product, causing him a loss, would this still be covered? Uh, allegations, whether unfounded or not, would um, would be open to defence costs. But again, if there's a conduct exclusion and there's been any finding of wrongdoing, then those costs could potentially be recoverable by the insurer. Okay. Um, what would you advise an insured who is a first-time buyer of DNO? and is unsure on how to measure the appropriate limit of liability that should be purchased? Well, uh, a broker would be able to assist their, um, that's their, their role generally. So the broker would be able to advise on the, the size of the company, the type of industry, the type of risk they're seeing. Um, for instance, whether you should buy side A, B, C or, or all of them, whether you need any specific endorsements added to reflect the type of work the company does. Um, but yeah, a, a broker will be able to advise first time buyers and ensure that the wording is appropriate. Brokers often have specific wordings, as do insurance companies as well, um, which are uh, are useful as a template and then they can be amended to reflect that the particular company or insurer's requirements. Thank you. Um, can a claim be made against the company instead of the director? Certainly could, or both. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, you, you see a whole range of claims um, in, involving uh, under a DNA policy. It can be the insured, the company, both. Um, there could be a conflict between the two as well, as that's something to be mindful of. Um, and that there's other exclusions that might apply in that situation. You could have a insured versus insured exclusion. Okay. Is the liability of a director limited or capped by law in Saudi Arabia, or are they unlimitedly personally liable? Uh, I, I personally don't know for Saudi Arabia. Do you know, Jane? Um, I will follow up. I can see who's sent that question. I will um, follow up with an email. Afterwards. Okay. Um, is it possible to pay DNO claims without taking legal actions? 
But do you mean if there isn't a legal action that they're incurring defence costs? I think we might need to contact you to find out a bit more what you mean. But but generally, uh, for defence costs to be recoverable, there would have to be a claim as defined in the policy. Okay, uh, another one here. Is it required that the event giving rise to a claim must be within policy period or agreed retroactive period? Sorry, can you repeat that one? Is it required that the event giving rise to a claim must be within the pol policy period or agreed retroactive period? Yes, so the claim must be notified uh, within the, the policy period, yeah. Or within a, an agreed extension, so. Um, how does an insured versus insured exclusion impact policy coverage and what circumstances may be excluded by this? Uh, an insured versus insured exclusion often arises if there's um, like a, a director against a director or company bringing the claim against a director. So you, you often see these in, in German claims. Um, you don't often see them in policy wordings. Um, it depends on the jurisdiction, but um, and again, it depends on the exclusion, but it will be exactly how it says. Um, so however insured is defined, it prevents an insured versus insured claim. That makes sense. <laughs> Great, thank you. So thanks everyone for sending in questions. We I can see that we have had a couple of jurisdiction specific questions. Um, so we will follow up with everybody individually afterwards, given the broad audience that we have today. Um, so please also feel free to get in touch with any of the speakers directly afterwards as well if you if you think of any other questions. Um, so we'll close for today. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and like I said before, there'll be a short survey to fill out um, as the session closes. So thanks and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.